is small in size, our community is rich in history. A history where our citizens put themselves at risk and in the end left an indelible mark on slavery and the Underground Railroad. Join me, Betty Campbell, for Ripley's story, Freedom's Light. The Rankins weren't the only Underground Railroad conductors in Ripley. In fact, there was a large network of men and women, black and white, who were doing the same type of work as the Rankins. Uh, families with the names of McCaig, Collins, Pogue, Campbell, and many others were also risking everything to help other people achieve freedom. We're going to be talking about some of these families and showing you their homes and most of them are on Front Street along the Ohio River in Ripley. But think about how dangerous it was to be an Underground Railroad conductor. Because if you were caught in the act of aiding a fugitive slave in any way, shape, or form, and you were convicted in court in Maysville, Kentucky, you could pay a fine, and you also could spend up to six months in jail. The first home with an Underground Railroad history on Front Street is at the west end of the street and that is the home of John Parker. John Parker is a very unusual Underground Railroad conductor because he was an African American who had been enslaved, was able to buy his freedom, and settled in Ripley, Ohio. And he's known for being an Underground Railroad conductor and a daring conductor but he was also a successful businessman. John Parker established his own foundry here in Ripley, Ohio, and his foundry buildings were on the property around his house. At the height of his business career, John Parker was employing 25 men in his foundry, and black and white men were working for John Parker. He was also an inventor. He invented farm-related equipment and held patents on his inventions, making him only one of a handful of African Americans to own patents on inventions before the year 1900. But we mostly focus on his career as an Underground Railroad conductor. John Parker was very daring and very bold. He was not content to wait until fugitives had crossed the Ohio River and were looking for assistance. John Parker would take his skiff, his rowboat, and row back across the Ohio River at night and bring slaves out of Kentucky. Very daring, very bold. Because had he been caught and convicted in court in Maysville, Kentucky, he would have had to pay a fine and he could have spent as long as six months in jail. Another thing about John Parker is his family. There were several children and all of his children were college educated. The next house we'll talk about are what we refer to as the Front Street Rankin Apartments. This house is a little bit deceiving just to look at it from the outside because the front facade has been rebricked, and these are rather modern front porches. But this house dates, we believe, from 1823 shortly after John Rankin arrives in Ripley in 1822. He purchases this Front Street bit of land and starts construction of what will become a three apartment dwelling. This is the home of Thomas McCaig and his wife Catherine, better known as Aunt Kitty, very devoted to the Underground Railroad cause. Thomas McCaig is a very wealthy man and he has the Midas touch when it comes to business. He attains a great deal of wealth, and among his businesses is the pork packing industry here in Ripley, Ohio. Farmers would drive their hogs into Ripley, and they would be slaughtered in the slaughterhouses on Upper Main Street, and then processed and put in big barrels 
hogsheads and put on boats and shipped up and down the Ohio River. And McCaig became very wealthy through this enterprise. A lot of his barrels of pork were being sent south, but here he is an Underground Railroad conductor in Ripley. This small house really doesn't have an Underground Railroad story, but in a way it does, because it has to do with Ulysses S. Grant and in turn the Civil War, which in turn is certainly about trying to free slaves. U.S. Grant grows up in Georgetown, but before he heads to West Point, he spends a year in Ripley residing in this home while he attends Ripley College. He needed to beef up some of his studies before going to West Point. So that's the historical association with this house, that it is where U.S. Grant resided while he spent a year attending Ripley College before going to West Point. Of course, after West Point, he spends his career in the military and leads all troops during the Civil War. This gray house with the burgundy shutters was the home of the Collins family, ardent Underground Railroad conductors, and here's their story. At one time behind their home stood a workshop because several of the Collins men were cabinet makers. They were making furniture. And also at that time in our history, generally if the, the cabinet makers were also making wooden coffins for burial and they have them stored in their workshop behind their home. The next home we're looking at certainly wasn't built during the period of the Underground Railroad. This is an Italianate style home built well after all of this activity was over with. But we talk about this home because on this site, the previous home that stood here was the home of Dr. Alfred Beasley, who was a physician in Ripley. And he is of the anti-slavery belief. He's certainly a conductor. This long row of houses that we're looking at, they were built by Colonel James Pogue, the founder of Ripley and they're referred to as row houses. It's a very simple style of building. It's called a federal style, and his family lived here for many years. Colonel Pogue founded Ripley in 1812, and he was also of anti-slavery beliefs, as were his children. He lived in one of these row houses, uh, but a part of his first floor was used for a general store. Colonel Pogue, owned a great deal of land in Ripley and the current Presbyterian Church, that land was donated by Colonel Pogue to serve as the land for Ripley's Presbyterian Church. This home is of the Greek Revival style and was the home of Dr. Alexander Campbell, who is considered Ohio's first abolitionist, coming to this area in 1803. His home at one time also served as the first courthouse in what was the early history of Brown County. Later, the county seat uh, was moved to Georgetown, Ohio, where it remains today. Dr. Campbell was also very active in politics and served in the state Senate and in the House, and then was appointed United States Senator from Ohio. He had strong anti-slavery beliefs and was an active conductor in his earlier years, but in his later years, uh, by the time someone such as John Parker arrives in Ripley in the early 1850s, he's more of a mentor to some of the other uh, conductors. Right now, we're standing in the visitor center of the Rankin House Memorial Home. This facility was built and opened in 2018, in the fall of 2018, in order to facilitate uh, the opportunity for people to come here and learn about the Rankins. Uh, it is really a one-of-a-kind facility, and prior to this being built, the Rankin House really didn't have a true office. For many, many years, all of the activities, ticket sales, and any type of merchandise sold, such as books and t-shirts, were sold out of one of the rooms inside the Rankin House. 
But around 2014, a project was started where the Rankin House was completely restored to the way it was around the 1840 era, as accurate as possible as to when the Rankins were living here and on this site. Uh, over a million dollars was spent to ensure the accuracy and the restoration, so the need for an office arose. So for two, almost three years, we operated out of a 10 foot by 10 foot wooden shed. Uh, with the one amenity being it had a front porch, so you're out of the rain. Uh, from there we took tickets, uh, we sold our merchandise, which was a few t-shirts and a few books. Not much, as you can imagine, with limited space. But we were able to, with the Ohio History Connection, um, build this facility. And as I said, it's a one-of-a-kind facility. In fact, right now, we're standing in just one of the rooms available. This is a 60-person classroom slash meeting room that we use not only for educational purposes, showing age-appropriate videos regarding uh, history, in particular the Underground Railroad and how it affected um, the entire uh, state as well as the nation. But we can also uh, facilitate meetings of people coming together to talk about issues of that day, talk about issues of this day, it also makes a great place for kids to have lunch on a rainy day. Um, prior to this, there was no real uh, lunchroom facilities, and if you came to visit the Rankin House and it was inclement weather, um, you ate your lunch on your bus. But now we can actually bring people in here and feed them a nice lunch. This also affords us the opportunity to split large groups into smaller groups, making it easier for everyone to have an opportunity to see what's going on in the Rankin House. When we split the classrooms into smaller groups, we have activities here such as videos, we have manipulatives for smaller children to help them understand um, what was necessary to go on an arduous journey like running away from slavery. But we also have educational, um, for lack of a better term, an educational scavenger hunt for older students such as high school students, even college students, with all of the answers for the scavenger hunt either on the walls in the facility or outside on many of our numerous signs. Um, a way to, uh, to get an uh, overall view of what the Rankin House was how, about, and then we dial that down as we take them on a tour into the home. I've had as many as 150 students on the property at any one time. Some of them in here, some of them on our 45 person deck, which also has picnic tables and can act as another outdoor classroom and on the grounds themselves, and none of those various student groups ran into each other. This is the door to our gift shop and ticket area for all visitors that come to the Rankin House, and we wanted to start here with information regarding the Rankin House itself. The two pictures here depict the Rankin House as it is today, sitting high on a bluff over the Ohio River. You can see the uh, hundred rock steps known as the Steps of Freedom connected with wooden steps that go all the way down to 4th Street. But this is how it looks today. The lower section of this display shows how the Rankin House has changed through the years, through the various owners that had it during the time, until it was purchased by the Ohio History Society back in 1938. We also see the bottom of the, uh, of the hill where the steps are. Obviously not a lot of trees there because at one point John Rankin cut them down. Many of them have grown back now, but you can see what it looked like over 100 years ago. Right in through here you can see the archaeological work in the dig regarding the restoration of the Rankin House itself and how it's changed over time. So from the very first moment you come into our facility, you're getting an education about what this place is all about. One of the items that we have here in the Visitor Center is this settee. The settee was created for the Chicago World's Fair, which opened in 1933 and ran to 1934. During that time, over 39 million people viewed this settee, and it is a piece of Ohio history, created specifically out of material from the state of Ohio to depict one of the most important events of Ohio, Eliza crossing the ice. Eliza is a character from Uncle Tom's Cabin, based on a real person, and her exploits in an attempt to get free. As you can see, looking at the back of the settee, it is carved out to show a slave catcher and his hounds chasing a woman, obviously carrying something, a small child, across the ice to the Ohio side. 
On the Ohio side, you see a tall spire, which was Rankin's church. And then as the cutout moves forward, you can see the hilltop with Rankin's home. The materials from the settee came from Ohio wood and from uh, wool from Ohio sheeps. Once again, created in 1933 for the Chicago World's Fair. And now it is estimated that over 49 million people have viewed this piece of history. The John Rankin House historic site is one of 58 sites in the state of Ohio that are owned by our State Historical Society, the Ohio History Connection. Rankin House, as are most of the other sites, are managed by local history groups. And here in Ripley, it is Ripley Heritage Incorporated, our local history organization that manages Rankin House for the Ohio Historical Society. And we have been managing this site since 1981, welcoming visitors from around the world to hear this important story of men and women, black and white, helping other people on the road to freedom. This story is as pertinent today as it was 150 years ago. It's a story of freedom, it's a story of brotherhood, it's a story of right over wrong. And a lot of it took place here in Ripley, Ohio. We're standing in the parlor of the home of John and Jean Rankin, probably the best known Underground Railroad conductors in the Ohio River Valley. This was the home of the Rankins from 1829 until 1866. But I'm gonna back up just a little and tell you how Rankin came to Ripley, because he wasn't an Ohioan. Reverend John Rankin was a Tennessean by birth and studied to become a Presbyterian minister. After his marriage to Jean Lowry, he and his wife set out on their ministry. After serving in churches in Kentucky for several years, Reverend Rankin accepted the call to become the minister at the Presbyterian Church here in Ripley, Ohio. And it's still an active church congregation today. This house we're in right now was not his first home when he came to Ripley. It was down along the river on what we call Front Street. The only house on the river with three, three front doors was the home of the Rankins for the first couple of years. As their family grew and they ended up with 13 children, nine sons and four daughters, the little house on Front Street just wouldn't accommodate the family. So they bought this 60 plus acre hillside farm that overlooks the village of Ripley, the Ohio River and the Kentucky Hills, and he built this brick home. And over a period of 40 plus years, the Rankins aided approximately 2,000 fugitive slaves on their way to freedom. Fortunately for us, Reverend Rankin wrote his autobiography as an older man. And in his autobiography, he wrote, I never lost a passenger, meaning all the fugitives in the care of this family were never caught by their owners or by bounty hunters and taken back into slavery. And Reverend Rankin was very proud of that. Throughout the years, the Rankins developed a reputation of keeping a light of some sort burning in the front window of their home overlooking the river. And that was used as a guide or a beacon to fugitives escaping out of Kentucky. They were told, if you make it to the river around Ripley in your escape, look for the house on the hill and the light in the window. That is a safe house and the family who lives here will take care of your needs and then help move you north to Canada. Reverend Rankin, as I said, wrote his autobiography and that's where we get a lot of our information that we share with our visitors. Several of the nine Rankin sons also wrote their remembrances and so that's the information that we draw upon to tell stories to our visitors. One of those is a documented story of the woman who became the famous character Eliza in Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. This slave woman lived over in the Dover, Kentucky area, almost in sight of this house. 
and she had learned she was going to be sold. And this is a woman who had several children, but she decided to attempt an escape and escape only with her youngest child, someone she could carry in her arms. And so she made her escape. It was in the winter time in the 1830s and the Ohio River had been frozen, but there had been a thaw and the ice was starting to break up. She stepped out onto the ice and was starting to cross with her child and there are bounty hunters right on her heels and the ice starts to give away and she falls into the cold, icy Ohio River. She climbs up on a cake of ice and with her baby and makes her way finally to the Ohio River shore here at Ripley. She scrambles up the steep river bank, comes into the front door of the Rankin house. The Rankins never locked their door at night for just such occasions. And when the Rankin sons come down that morning, they write later on that we discovered this woman sitting in our parlor by our stove, wringing out her wet clothes. And that is the person that became Eliza in Harriet Beecher Stowe's famous novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The family of Harriet Beecher Stowe and the Rankin family were friends. The Beechers lived in Cincinnati and the Rankins here in Ripley, and they visited back and forth. Harriet's father was Lyman Beecher, who came to Cincinnati to become the president of Lane Theological Seminary, and they were educating men to become ministers. And some of the Rankin sons even attended Lane Theological Seminary. So, and they're all the Presbyterian faith. They have a shared view that slavery is wrong, and so they become friends, and the Rankins share some of their stories of helping slaves escape with the Beecher family. And later on, when Harriet writes her famous book, then she incorporates that story, and that turns into the character Eliza in Uncle Tom's Cabin. Lots of our visitors want to know where were the slaves hidden. We tell our visitors what we know to be a fact from the writings of the Rankin family, and that is that there was at one time a large barn on the west side of the property, and the barn had a wooden floor and a, uh, a door, a secret door in the floor, and a lot of space dug out underneath. And we know that that is where the Rankins hid slaves. Were they hiding them here in this historic house, in the attic, in the cellar? Having grown up in Ripley, that's the story that I always heard. But we can't say for certain that the Rankins were hiding slaves here in the house. Very likely they were, but we don't have any written proof of that. And to tell an accurate story, that's what you need to do. The Rankin family were opposed to slavery, but in order to protect themselves from bounty hunters, from slave owners and such, they did keep firearms here in their home. Here at Rankin House in the parlor, we have a Kentucky long rifle over the front door because one of the Rankin sons wrote in one of his letters that that is one of the places where they kept one of their firearms. And that leads into a gunfight battle story that took place here between some of the adult Rankin sons and Kentucky bounty hunters. Their idea was, we'll set their barn afire, that will flush out the Rankin men, then we'll have our way with them, with these Rankins, these troublemakers, these agitators. And that's the way the Rankins were viewed by a lot of people outside of the Ripley area. But one of the Rankin sons had gotten wind of this plan when he was down in town. So when he comes back up to the house, he pulls his other brothers aside and he says, there might be trouble for our family tonight. So when we go to bed, my suggestion is we don't undress, we'll just take off our boots and be ready in case there is trouble. We're not gonna tell our parents, they have enough to deal with and worry about, and maybe nothing will happen. So the household settles down that particular night, and sure enough, this Rankin son hears sounds outside. He knows someone is on their property that shouldn't be there. 
So he throws back the bed covers, runs across uh, to the dresser and picks up his pistol, runs out the back door. He doesn't even take time to pull on his boots. One of his brothers upstairs and a cousin have heard the same noise, so they bound down the stairs and they're out the back door. And the door slams shut and Reverend and Mrs. Rankin then are awakened. What has Mrs. Rankin, their mother, heard? She hears their back door slam and then later she hears gunfire. So she's so afraid of what might be happening to her family. She runs around the house and tries to lock all the doors. And the other Rankin sons who are just now up and, and getting out and want to help their brother and cousin, they come downstairs and they, they go around the inside of the house until they can find one of the windows that hasn't been nailed shut and climb out the window and join the gunfight battle. When it's all over, None of the Rankin men are injured with exception of one, and he has a bullet that grazes his shoulder. Several of the Kentucky bounty hunters are seriously injured. And this provoked Reverend Rankin so much, who for years had always turned the other cheek when wrong was committed against him. He finally had had enough, and he writes a letter in the local newspaper, The Castigator, explaining to anyone who is reading the paper on both sides of the Ohio River that take notice if any of you come planning to do harm to me or to my family know that I will defend my family and you have tried to burn my property you have tried to harm my family and why because I am an abolitionist and he puts the word abolitionist in all capital letters because I am an abolitionist. But this is just fair warning that if anything like this happens again, know that I will defend my family. And all of this can be read for your pleasure and at your leisure by reading Anne Hagedorn's wonderful nonfiction book, Beyond the River. It is the story of the Ripley Underground Railroad conductors, and the main focus is Reverend John Rankin and his family. For a lot of our younger visitors, coming to the kitchen area of the Rankin house opens up their eyes to what preparing a meal or how uh, people lived back in the period of the Underground Railroad, the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. For example, sugar and all other commodities had to be, for the most part, had to be shipped in. Uh, people weren't raising sugar here in Ohio, and so sugar would come in containers like this, in solid form, or even in bigger containers, and be wrapped in paper, and then you would buy it and uh, chop it apart or cut it apart with something called sugar snippers. For lighting, of course, there's no electricity and so most people were making their own candles. This is a candle mold and you would take a block of wax and this could be a uh, from the, this could be beeswax and you would melt it and pour it into these molds and let it cool and get hard and then turn this over and out pops your candles such as this and so light in a house was very important candles were very precious uh, and if you wanted to do any type of work at night you were either using candlelight or uh, oil from an oil lamp to light your room. Cooking took a lot of time and a lot of effort. Women were really in the kitchen nearly most of the day. Uh, this is called a dry sink because of course there's no indoor plumbing and so you would put a pan in here and fill it with water and wash your dishes. And then there's a hole in this. You put a bucket underneath, pull out the plug and your 
water comes out into the bucket and then you throw it out. Every bit of water you used in your house had to be brought in from the cistern or the well. And then, the, of course, then the dirty water has to be taken out. So preparing a meal took a lot of time and a lot of effort. We're here in what was the bedroom for Reverend Rankin and his wife, but it also served as his study. This is where he would compose his sermons and also where he would write a lot of his anti-slavery material. Uh, the Presbyterian Church here in Ripley, and it's still an active church congregation today, was Reverend Rankin's church for some 40 plus years. But during the Civil War, the Presbyterian Church congregation physically split over the issue of slavery. One group thought, as Reverend Rankin did, that there should be the immediate abolition of slavery and slaves should be freed immediately. The other group felt that, yes, slavery was wrong and they should be freed, but let's do it over a more organized period of time. And they, the, two congreg the congregation split in two and one part of the congregation worshiped in one building in Ripley, and the other part of the congregation worshiped in another church building. At the conclusion of the Civil War, the two groups came back together and became one congregation again. For 20 years, from 1845 to 1865, I labored in this borderland in and around Ripley, Ohio. In that time, I knew everything that went on, whether I was a participant or not. This little town today is quiet and peaceful, with no indications of the fierce passions that disturbed its people during the period I have indicated. There was a time, however, when fierce passions swept this little town dividing its people into bitter factions. I never thought of going uptown without a pistol in my pocket, a knife in my belt, and a blackjack handy. Day or night, I dare not walk on the sidewalks for fear someone might leap out of a narrow alley at me. What I did, the other men did, walked the streets armed. This was a period when men went armed with pistol and knife and used them on the least provocation. When under cover of night, the uncertain steps of slaves were heard quietly seeking their friends. When the mornings brought strange rumors of secret encounters the night before, but daylight showed no evidence of the fray. When pursuers and pursued stood at bay in a narrow alley with pistols drawn ready for the assault. When angry men surrounded one of the houses referred to, kept up gunfire until late in the afternoon, endeavoring to break into it by force in search of runaways. These were the days of passion and battle, which turned father against son and neighbor against neighbor. enjoyed the video. Um, at this time, for those who don't know me, my name is Melissa Carmen. I am the director at the Sutliff Museum. Um, and if you're not familiar where the Sutliff Museum is, it is in Northeast Ohio in Warren. Um, and 
I would like to introduce to you Betty Campbell, who is the site manager of the Rankin House, and Howard McLean, who is one of the docents there. Um, first off, can you introduce yourselves? Tell us a little bit about um, your background. Um, I'm Betty Campbell, and I grew up in Ripley and grew up hearing all this history about the Underground Railroad, and I have my own interesting family history. I'm a direct descendant of the first permanent settler here in Brown County who came in 1794. So history has always been very important to me. And then when our, um, our historical society had the opportunity to manage Rankin House back in 1981, we uh, voted to do that because it was so important to keep the story alive and tell the history. So um, we've been operating the site since 1981, but since 1948, when the state of Ohio first opened Rankin House, that's how long we've been telling this Ripley Underground Railroad story. And I'm Howard McLean. I am the, the, uh, the one and only dose that we have right now at this time. I was willing to train new people for that so that we can pass the history down to uh, younger generations that they can pass it on. I have a degree, a uh, bachelor's in history from Moorhead State University in Moorhead, Kentucky. Also a degree in radio, television, communications. And the lady who was the instructor of the students who put together our video was one of my classmates at Moorhead State. Um, Betty asked me to come up here and fill in for a little while in 2016. Um, and I'm still here today. It is a labor of love, a passion, and I took my first tour here back in the 1970s as a school board. Well, welcome. Thank you so much. And we do have Patty here on the program. Awesome. So thank you, Patty. Thank you to your students. Um, it was very well done. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to watch. I was. I didn't know you were going to say anything, but we certainly enjoyed doing it. And the kids, it was a, a great learning experience for them. And uh, we're actually going to do a little longer version so that we could uh, get into some of the history of the uh, Front Street uh, abolitionists because we had to, to take out so much. And it was a you know, wonderful piece from Betty. And, and so now we're going to put that back in and, and share that with the Rankin House. Awesome. Yeah, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just saw that you were on. Thank you, Patty. Um, no problem. So until some yes. questions come in, please put your questions into the chat box. Um, I love having you from the Rankin House in because you are one of the first stops in Ohio on the Underground Railroad. And then we and Warren are one of the last. <laughs> <laughs> so Absolutely. it's kind of connecting the, the trail. Um, in the video with the house, one of my questions is the, um, the stenciling, is that original? Yes, when the house was restored several years ago, uh, before any physical work was done, the Ohio History Connection, they had specialists come in and do a paint analysis of the house. And what they determined through that paint analysis was that after the house was finished in 1829, the first layer of paint put on the walls and on the woodwork is exactly what you see today. The woodwork uh, in the two front rooms overlooking the work is this pretty uh, robin egg blue. And then the stenciling in the two front rooms, that's the exact patterns and the exact colors that the Rankins chose. Um, we only had small sections of the stenciling in both rooms that we discovered, but there are stenciling reference books. And so once you locate your pattern, you're able to recreate that completely. And of course, through the paint analysis, we knew what colors they had chosen. So we were really excited about that. When we first started this project, we hoped that you know, the best we hoped for was to maybe find some early 
wallpaper, but to find the stenciling. Well, we just broke out the champagne that day and celebrated because that was such a great find. Yes, it is beautiful. I love wallpaper. It. Wallpaper was an expensive thing to do back then. Stenciling was a whole lot easier. And Rankins, every every dime they had to support the family and their efforts on the Underground Railroad. So stenciling, they were going to beautify. That would make the most sense, too. Okay. Um, the story of Eliza and that bench, that, that's also a gorgeous piece. Um, I know you talked a little bit about it in the film. Can you um, tell us a little bit more? Because um, it was a little hard to hear. I don't know if anybody got it. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, do you want to do that? Sure. Uh, that particular piece was created for the uh, World's Fair 1933. And what it, uh, what it was done was to depict a historic event important to Ohio. Uh, several states, if not all of them, were asked to contribute something of historical significance, create something specific. And what that did was it explained in that relief cutout the, uh, briefly, you can look and see the story of Eliza coming from Kentucky being pursued uh, by a uh, owner or even a slave catcher uh, using hounds, which was, which was a common occurrence. Her crossing the ice, you can actually see three breaks in the ice because the story of Eliza has her actually breaking through the ice um, three times while carrying her child, uh, making it to the North Shore and then passing the church and coming up to, and there's a depiction of the Rankin House at the top of the hill. Um, it's, it's just a fabulous piece and uh, made from Ohio wood, the wool from Ohio sheep. Um, just really, it is Ohio and tells the heart of that story that happened here. Um, viewed, estimated by 39 million people during the World's Fair uh, and afterwards, and probably about 10 million since because, you know, we're almost, uh, almost 100 years uh, since it was created. So um, it's a very, very important piece. Uh, we keep close watch on it. Uh, and keep it in the in the gift shop where we can keep it behind ropes and somebody's got an eye on it all the time. It's, it's such an important thing. And it, it really solidifies the story of Eliza because if it wasn't true and it was an amalgam of people, not one that, that has a, a real life basis, it wouldn't have been done. Uh, we have a question from Facebook because we are live on Facebook. Um, Michelle is asking what the fringe along the roof line is for and what is it made of? Okay, do you want me to get that ready? Okay, um, on the top of the roof line, what you see is what's called rooster tailor. Okay, uh, it looks like a rooster's tail with it heads down while they're eating. Uh, what that does by turning those, um, shingles. those shingles this to the opposite way, it actually helps act as a runoff so that most of the weather, which comes from the river, runs off back toward the river and not onto the roof line and the seam above, above the sides of the road. So that's a common occurrence of, of buildings built in the 1800s. Um, if you have some people that want to travel down to uh, Tennessee outside of Mountain Bird, Cades Cove has several examples of that also. Just uh, It's just a way to protect the roof. Yep. That's very interesting. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions. Um, I hope that we've sparked interest in um, our northern Ohio people to come down south and see um, all that Ripley has to offer. Because